So I recently put together some thoughts on this idea of our ego and the role that it plays in our lives and how um, how we can begin to better reflect on this ego to manifest a, a, a much more harmonious and hopefully simple life. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, so we're defined so much by who we are and by what we have. We're compared on what we own, what wealth we have, what school our kids go to, what cars we drive. You know, you know only just the other day I was speaking to a woman that felt shameful driving up to her private school to collect her kids. You know, she has a an old barina, and she gets glares from the other mothers, not because of anything other than the fact that she doesn't own a top of the range car, you know, and when she's approached them in in the past, they've actually shunned her. Not because they've got to know who she was or is, but what she has. And I hear these types of stories all the time, fueled by programs on MTV of ludicrous wealth being wasted on the ignorant. And it fuels a culture of of ignorance and comparison. Now we We've been told what we hold in a bank account means more than what we can hold in our hearts. Or what we hold in our heart. As children, we sh- we're shown more about what we have that defines us. The, the more toys, the better computer games, the, the better grades, the better sporting skills. This is what makes you a better person. Being the best. This, we're told this, this is what makes us important. So we grow up living a life where accumulation is the pinnacle of our pyramid. We we live a life of accumulating things. And that's where our value lies. Leading us to feel like we need more of something to complete us. It's the things that end up defining us. And then when we don't have these things, we feel inferior. We feel lack. We feel ashamed. And... This feeling, this, this sense of anxiety, of lack, just fuels that egoic fire more. This side of you that sees itself as that wealthy person driving around in a rich car and well-to-do, all the rest of it, that's basically tutting at you and shaking their head and saying, you should have tried harder in this and you should have done that and you should have done that. This endless list of things that you should have done to have made yourself better, but you didn't, you failed. It just never stops. This, this is our evolutionary mind. You know, it, 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 it doesn't sort of, it doesn't get to the end of an accreditation and think, yeah, that's it. You've done it. You don't need to learn anything more. It goes, no, nah, maybe, maybe if I know, if I know a bit more and I get a degree, oh, that's when I'll be content and happy. And then you get to the end of the degree and he goes, no, definitely need, need to become the, get a master of it. And then a, a doctorate and then a professorship. And and now that you've got the professorship, now I need to discover something new and and begins to it begins to define you by what you've done, not the person that you are or who you have been all along the way. It's defined purely on these certif- certifications, on the, on the knowledge that you've you've gained. This endless list of things that just never stops you know this, there is some beauty in that though you know in its own right i mean the discovery is what we've made of humans because of this drive that we have this evolutionary process has been why we've seen space shuttles reach the moon we've seen di- diseases eradicated that puts warmth and light in everyone's homes although we all have the same brain not all of us have the same skills, the same intellect. And we put ourselves down because we feel like as if we've been given a bad hand in things. And even when I watch YouTube clips and I hear some of the eloquency that I, I hear people speaking, you know, like um, Jordan Peterson and things like that, you know, and they have a, a, a gift with how they talk how they can portray their thoughts and feelings about things. And I think, I wish I could do that. I wish I had that lack, that skill to be able to really tell people 
the way they do. We begin to define ourselves not as what joy do I bring into people's lives or what do I do to help or how much do I love myself. And that's not from an egoic standpoint, but from a realization of the beauty that is you. The incomparableness that is you, the inde- indefinableness that is you. Now, the ego only works off of definitions and labels, what we identify as, the, the labels we put on ourselves, like oh, I'm a mental health facilitator, a dad, a son, a brother, a husband, a friend, an, <laughs> an asshole to some people, maybe. When in reality, none of these things define me. I don't need to be defined by other dads or other husbands, other roles, other characters that people want me to play. What I've learned is what truly defines me comes from the heart. A place so sacred that ego can't touch. The love of my children, the love of my family and friends. The happiness you see in people's faces that are around you. This is our measuring stick. And what did you do today to make one person's life better? Now this is a question I ask my kids every day. <laughs> Sometimes they make up the answer, but I want them to know that this is what defines us. Now Martin Luther King, one of my absolute heroes, which I've I have him tattooed on my arm for those that don't, haven't seen it, as a reminder every day that you know that one man can change the world. And again, not from an egoic sense, but in the depths of hate and racism, that beauty can rise from the ashes. That it takes a voice, an action, a deeper understanding of what it takes to be human. That we can do things non-violently. You know, one of his quotes, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We've guided missiles and misguided men. Now I have... This quote on my laptop comes up every day just to remind me of the egoic nature of ourselves, of of me, of, of I. And I suppose we could bring that quote maybe into the 20th century and say, the power of marketing has outrun the power of our hearts. We love things more than we love ourselves. And Shanti Deva has a, a verse in his prayer that may I become the medicine. And this egoic sense of ourselves is flame is fanned brightly by our school system that are, is built on comparisons. You know, if you do the best, if you get your certificate up on stage, if you become a prefect, if you conform to the system, accumulating awards, then you're seen as successful. You've made it. Even my Six-year-old feels lack if she doesn't come home with, at the end of the day with the end of day note, which shows her successes. You know, she thrives on this success. And it's tough trying to remind her that this is not what success is in its entirety. This is just a part of it. And what happens? What happens when something in your life disrupts this fulfillment by things, by success, by whatever? What happens when all of a sudden you become ill, get fired from work, don't get hired because there's another person that's better than you, or you find your partner cheating on you, or a pandemic hits, and everything you do comes to a grinding halt, and there is just you, and your thoughts, and emotions. A real depth of lack of self-worth at home. There are so many possibilities of these things that could go wrong, but when just never shown this reality, we are sheltered and then unleashed, which is no wonder why the largest cause of death in people um, aged 16 to 25 is suicide, because we aren't prepared for the culture that we've been bred into. We have all this success at school and then nothing. And if this is our yardstick, if accumulation of wealth and accreditation is what we compare success as, this egoic egoic view of our existence with no tools to manage the mind when it goes bad, you know, when we begin to, it begins to turn on you when you're not measuring up to the 
very high standards that it sees itself as. We find ourselves anxious and depressed, comparing ourselves about who we were or what we could have been. We only know comparisons. We only know accumulation of things. We never learn who we are. And I use the we there rather than the very Zen I, or who am I, as this incessant search for the seat of the I within us. That very real who am I question. And we begin to recognize it's a bit of a goose chase, as most things in Zen are. But how could we ever find something that's not there? You know, who am I trying to find? And there's some wonderful answers in that question in itself. But it's the transformation of this, this I am to we are that allows you to see the beauty in everything. Your beauty in everything. That we can see the even the inanimate with all. Without separation. There was a quote by Waldo Emerson. Now, apologies if I don't get this right. Um, I believe it is, now, when the world is constantly trying, no, that's it. being yourself in a world that is wanting you to be something else or is constantly trying to make you something else is the beauty of our existence or something similar. Apologies, Waldo, if you're listening to that. I've got that wrong. And what he means is, you know, if you can be yourself in a world that wants you to be something else, that is the definition of your existence. That's why you're here, to find who you are. And this ego, it doesn't know that. It only knows the perspective of others. That's what it learns from. It learns how others have perceived you. It doesn't know you. How could it? It would never speak to you like the way it does. So we need to inquire into ourselves. This is the medicine. This is the antidote. We need to rid ourselves of the thought of getting rid of any ego. It is impossible to get rid of it. How do we get rid of something that isn't even really there? It's just a voice in our head. It's, it's not tangible. And there is no battle to be won here. You just need to soften the flame enough to show ourselves that there, that that this is not who we are. This is not what defines us or defines me. That there is much more to me and, and you and, and everything and and that these thoughts are only perspectives of others, not my own. And when we begin to dim that egoic flame and fan the love and kindness flame, what happens is a, a flowering of the ego. That it turns away from being a bully and there is a, a, a distinct transition. Now for me, being depressive and anxious and suicidal at times, it was a battle for me at the start. I fought it every minute. I didn't know any other way. I even fought it in my sleep all the time. It was some horrible nightmares. But when I started to inquire into myself, I started following the path of liberation from Buddhist texts. And in particular, was a line out of Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, when he said, fighting with your ego will just make it stronger. So I stopped. Right then, I made a conscious decision that I'm not going to fight with me anymore. And I also made a conscious decision that every day I'm going to make effort to be kinder to myself. And that alongside a regular meditation practice. And when I say regular, I mean every day. Up to an hour and a half most days. And that went on for several years. But it, it was the first six months where I really began to see the transformation. And in that first six months when I made that conscious decision, I just thought, you know, I recognized just how much energy I was consuming, battling myself. And I just thought, I just need to divert some of this energy into something more helpful. Or as my teacher would say, a much more fruitful practice. And it was the best investment of my time for me that I had, I ha, I have, or have, am, or had, ever done. So we learn not to fight ourselves. We learn kindness and compassion is the key. Right at the heart of you is a completely compassionate being that just wants to be loved and be part of love. 
And so we just need to begin to soften that voice in our head. Because how we think about ourselves matters a lot. So I hope you enjoyed that um, that little podcasty thing. And if you did, please don't hesitate to subscribe or like or share. Please, I'd love to get this message out to as many people as I can, especially if you enjoyed it. I'd love your comments. What did you like or not like about it? Um, please and thank you so very much. Have an amazing rest of your day.